And in the T Bible, page 1013, reading from verse 2. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them. And a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come and they have done to him everything they wished just as it is written about him. The second reading comes from Revelation, chapter 1, page 1233. The Revelation from Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. John, your brother and companion, in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that there are in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a voice like the trumpet 
which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash round his chest. The hair on his head was, was white, like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father God, we ask you in your grace and love to speak to each one of us your truth. Help us to understand the Lord Jesus better, to see his glory and to be affected in our hearts and lives by the revelation of him. Amen. What if you feel under pressure? Most of us know what it feels like to feel squeezed, maybe just a sense of too much to do, or somebody trying to make us and push us into doing something we don't want to do, or all kinds of things could come in the category of pressure. And for a Christian, we can be under the kind of pressure that might make us feel like giving up in trusting and following Jesus. The kind of pressures that Christians have always faced have included things like suffering, which is often in the form of persecution, deliberate suffering inflicted by people, by other people, because we are Christians. But it's not only persecution, pressure can come uh, from inside. We can experience uh, temptation um, and the desire to go away that we know is not God's way. We might experience health issues that give us pain or attack our hope because of the, the health and mortality of ourselves or the people we love. And pressure comes to the Christian from Christians who have always understood from the world, the flesh, and the devil. And churches have always been under attack from the devil who hates to see God's people saved by Jesus, rejoicing in him and safe in him forever. What we've heard read to us this morning from Revelation 1 is what we need in the face of pressure. 
And if you've got it open, that's great to keep it open. If you don't, um, it would be very helpful to turn to page one, two, three, three, um, and follow along in the Bible as we start our series in this the, a series of another seven weeks in the first three chapters of Revelation. And uh, then, God willing, we'll follow on and look at more of the book um, in subsequent series. For the first three verses, I've got the heading in these Bibles, prologue, and uh, give us a bit of an introduction to what this book is. It's the revelation from Jesus Christ. What does revelation mean? Well, it, it means uncovering, unveiling. It's, it gives us a glimpse of something that's normally hidden. And thinking in the terms of what we were looking at last week, a glimpse of what's going on behind the scenes, what's on the front side of the tapestry, where at the moment we're only seeing the tangled web, normally, of the mess of our lives, the things that seem to be going wrong and the things that have done to us and the wrong choices we make and all that. But knowing by faith that God is over all, all of this and is in control, he gives a revelation that helps us to see something of what's on the other side. And it's a revelation from Jesus Christ. So it's from Jesus or from God through Jesus to his servants. That includes us, you and me. And how does it come to us? Well, it, if you look at um, these opening verses, it, it comes by an angel, by a, someone called John, who writes it down, and then to those who read it out and hear it being read. And according to verse 3, it's a good thing. It's good for us to read and to hear this. Look at verse three. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those who hear it and take to heart what's written in it because the time is near. So if you're thinking, oh, why are we having a series in Revelation? That's a bit odd, isn't it? It's, isn't it a bit of a, a happy hunting ground for wild theories? and uh, strangeness, impossible to understand, and a bit remote from our lives today. Well, listen to what it says about itself, what God says here. There's blessing in reading this and taking it to heart. Because the time is near. The time, of course, is looking forward to Jesus' return. And so... Uh, how do you feel about it saying that is near? And this was written 2,000 years ago. So was that a mistake, thinking it was near there? Well, don't forget 2 Peter 3, verse 8. Look it up later if you uh, don't can't call to mind what it says. But in the context of people scoffing about the, the claim that Jesus is coming soon and the fact that he hasn't come yet, Peter writes that with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. So from God's perspective, it is soon. And we need to understand this is coming soon, this day when Jesus returns. And we don't know when. He's told us that none of us will know when. It's going to come like a thief in the night, but certainly will come. And it's soon and we need to be ready for it. And in our preparation for that, let's take to heart the words of Revelation. Now, it is presented in the form of a letter. So verses 4 to 8 bear the marks of the, the classic structure of a letter from uh, this kind of time and place where the convention is. Um, you say, first of all, who it's from, and then who it's to, and then a, a greeting and blessing. So it's from, verse 4, John. And some people have 
um, argued about who that might be and have some different ideas about who might actually have written this, but I don't see any reason really to not to think that it is John, the close friend of Jesus, the one who featured in the other reading that we had, who went up the mountain with um, James, uh, Peter, and Jesus, and so uh, was John's son of Zebedee um, wrote the fourth gospel and described himself there as the disciple Jesus loved, seems to be a particularly close friend of the Lord Jesus when he was on earth in the flesh. And so, uh, who's it to? So the seven churches in the province of Asia, which is the area that's now Turkey, and those seven churches are named later on in the passage. And then if you turn over the page, you see the next two chapters contain seven letters, one each to these um, seven churches in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, and so on. And those places are on the kind of ring road around that province of Asia, Turkey. And so, um, Something I think we should be aware of is that there are quite a lot of numbers in the book of Revelation, and I think they're nearly always symbolic. So it's a mistake if we read the number of thousand in Revelation and think that it is literally uh, something that you can count to a thousand. Well, the number 666 being um, literally that number, it is symbolic. And the number seven here. I think, though it is literally seven churches that are named, it is not only to those seven churches, because after, at the end of each of those letters, you look ahead to chapter two, verse seven, that each of these letters say this, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the churches. And the seven letters were all sent to all seven of the churches. And the number seven, often in the Bible, symbolizes completeness. Right from creation, when in seven days, the Lord completed his work of creation. And so these seven churches represent the whole church and every church. And so these letters are for us, as well as for those um, named recipients. So from John to the seven churches to us and greetings, grace and peace to you. What a Christian uh, greeting from him who is and who was and who is to come. Who's that? Well, verse eight, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And clearly, anyone who's read the Old Testament and New Testament knows that that is talking about God. So it, it's a, a blessing from God, but God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's one God in three persons as we've understood in the Trinity, and we said in the Apostles' Creed earlier in this service. And so John expresses that Trinitarian idea. God could be referring to God without distinction, or could be referring to God the Father, who is one with the Spirit, or as it says here, the seven spirits, again, the number seven signifying that perfection and completeness and the footnote tells you could be translated the sevenfold spirit because he is one the holy spirit and jesus christ so father spirit and son and jesus is the faithful witness the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth that's who jesus is the lord of lords He's the risen Lord Jesus, firstborn from the dead. He's the first fruits. He's going to raise up many others, but he's already come to life 
resurrected from the dead, and he's the faithful witness. He's persevered, he's suffered, he speaks the truth because he is the truth. And John continues his blessing, not just asking blessing on his readers from uh, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but giving blessing and praise to God, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, the Lord Jesus, who died for us to rescue us and set us free from the penalty and power of sin. And made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory. I don't know how many of you have clicked on the link in uh, the email I sent out on Friday. But we'll hear while we're sharing communion as well. A song that's based on those words of blessing and praise to the one who loved us and loves us and uh, saved us. Gave his blood for us glory and power to him look john says in verse seven we're still in the introduction to his letter and he's telling us to to look and see he's coming with the clouds what on earth does that mean well he's clearly alluding to daniel chapter seven and i think we need to keep a finger in um, revelation one and turn back to page um, 893, <laughs> Daniel chapter 7, and the prophet Daniel had a vision that is very much in John's mind as he is writing this letter, writing up what he's seen. So, um, the reference to the clouds and uh, coming with the clouds is there in um, verse 13 of Daniel 7. In my vision at night, I looked, so this is Old Testament, of course, from a long time before Jesus, but Daniel was given this vision. There before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven he approached the Ancient of Days, that's God, whom he's described earlier in this chapter, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. Isn't that a shocking thing to say about a human being, the Jewish monotheist? And yet God gave him this vision of a, a human being being worshipped. The Son of Man, that is because he is God in the flesh. His dominion, the place where he is Lord, is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His lordship, his dominion, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So, as John writes, his letter, he's using some language from Daniel and uh, reminding us of what the prophet Daniel saw, that Jesus is the son of man and son of man is the term that Jesus used for himself. And every eye will see him, even those who pierce him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So he's drawing together some other prophecies there fulfilled in Jesus, so shall it be. Amen. Some people have seen in this a, a particular reference to the Jewish people, and I think it's a mistake, a serious mistake, to take that as um, justification for any anti-Semitism, because those who pierced him literally was the Romans. I, but any people from any nation who reject and despise <laughs> Jesus 
are included in this. It was my sin that held him back. And so all peoples on earth, anyone who rejects Jesus will mourn because of him. When this day comes, when we see him coming with the clouds, And God says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, who was, is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Just as God had revealed himself um, to Moses, I am who I am. God is. And that's not just that he is existing in the present. He eternally is. He doesn't depend on anything else. Everything comes from him. And the fact that God is makes a big difference to our outlook do you believe that god is we didn't make him up he is now john then describes to us his vision we've had a uh, sort of introduction to the introduction and now um, here we go. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering, which is a word for pressure, and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. Christian life means patiently enduring, keeping going at this stage as we wait for Jesus' return. It was on the island of Patmos, a little island, quite isolated, and that is because he'd been banished by the Romans, because of the, what does John say? The word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He wouldn't shut up about this dangerous news about the Lord Jesus risen from the dead when I, the Roman emperor wanted people to worship him as God and so was starting to kill Christians. So John was stuck on his own on this island of Patmos, couldn't go to church on the Sunday. The Lord's Day is the reference to Sunday. But he says, I was in the spirit and I heard a loud voice like a trumpet. So write on a scroll what you see and send it to those seven churches. So we don't know whether the entire vision of the book of Revelation was given to him on that day, that Sunday, or whether it was over a period of time, and this instruction to write it down came either before or after he'd seen everything that he then wrote down. And what he then saw, at first, not where the voice was coming from, but seven golden lampstands and then he's looking a bit more and sees among the lampstands someone like a son of man there's that expression again it's talking about jesus in all his glory and then here he he draws on that daniel 7 language again to describe what he saw so the book of Revelation was not dictated to him word for word. God spoke these words through John's choice of words. Um, so human creativity and use of Old Testament language. Dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his waist. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. This, this is picking up on that Daniel 7 language again. Um, don't worry if you've lost the place, but I, I've had it marked. And Daniel 7, before the thing about the Son of Man coming, was a description of the Ancient of Days. Verse 9, his clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. So it's talking about Jesus in terms that describe God. In his, and his uh, feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace 
and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. Have you heard a powerful river going over a waterfall that's so loud you can't hear anyone speak? The voice of Jesus is so powerful which is also the symbolic reference of, of the sharp double-edged sword coming out of his mouth. His words cut effectively both ways. So the gospel, the word of Jesus, cuts when it brings us salvation and awakens faith and brings forgiveness to us. So we're assured of God's uh, love and security and hope. And if we reject that, the sword cuts the other way in condemnation. The lampstands that Jesus is walking amongst represent the churches, we're told in verse 20. We're each given our little light and are to shine as lights in the world for the light of the world, Jesus. And the stars that he has in his right hand, here, it explains are the angels of the seven churches, which um, I'm not sure I fully understand whether it's talking about an, an angelic being, as most of the other many, many references to angels in the book of Revelation are talking about a spiritual being, or if it's talking about human messengers, because an angel means a messenger. So it could be talking about the um, Angels who have a special responsibility to look after the churches, which we don't know very much about. It could be talking about the human leaders of those churches, or it could be talking about the mess human messengers that carry the letter to those churches. Um, but in any case, they're held in Jesus' right hand, his hand of authority. And the churches are very special to Jesus. The effect on John of this vision is verse 17, to fall at his feet as though dead. Even though John had been a close friend of Jesus and reclined next to him at the table for the Lord's Supper and leaned back on him and then had his feet washed by him, saw him every day. He sees Jesus now and bang, he's on the floor. He sees Jesus, the risen Lord, reigning Jesus in all his glory. Do we see that same Jesus? Does it make us fear him? Well, Jesus' response is, hand on his shoulder, do not be afraid. Not because Jesus isn't But he is the first and the last, the living one. He was dead and now he is alive and he holds the keys of death and hell. But for the one who trusts in him, he's saying, don't be afraid because this is for you. The keys of death and hell. No need to be afraid of those things anymore. And so, no fear. So, with this vision, if we're facing pressure, this is the vision we need. We need to remember and look up to the Lord Jesus. Feel like giving up. We can't give up if we're falling before the one who is the first and the last, 
who was dead and is alive and holds the keys of death and Hades. He walks among the lampstands, so he cares for each church and he knows each church. And this vision, this description of Jesus is drawn on in the next um, couple of chapters, which we're going to look at over the next seven weeks, an aspect of what was seen in Jesus. And also Jesus says, I know you to each of these churches. He's walking amongst the, the lampstands. And he, he knows their context. He knows their struggles. He knows their pressures. And he knows their deeds. None of this goes unseen to the one with eyes of blazing fire. If we have our pressures that we feel nobody understands, Jesus sees it. So look up to him. He takes it all into account. And so may we be enlivened and enabled to keep going, trusting and following him as we look up to this Lord Jesus. Let's pray.